Hey everyone, and welcome back to the Ontario Aquaculture Research Centre. I'm your host, Kaylee Moore, one of the agricultural assistants here at OARC. If you're looking to learn more about aquaculture, you're in the right place. On today's episode, we have Emily D'Souza, one of the co-hosts from Coastal Routes Radio, joining us today to talk about her research and her advocacy work in educating consumers on selecting sustainable seafood. Hi guys and welcome back to our channel. I'm super excited to introduce Emily D'Souza. She is a University of Guelph graduate from the Environmental Governance Program and now finishing her master's in geography and her and her research is focused on seafood value chains. Emily, can you talk a little bit about how you got here and becoming an advocate for seafood sustainability education? Yeah, for sure. So thanks again for having me. I'm super excited to be chatting with you today. Um, And so I kind of got involved in sustainability broadly um, because of my little brother. He's always been like interested in the environment and he uh, he got me interested in it as well, which is what led me to uh, the environmental governance program at Guelph. And so I learned a lot about environmental policy and economics. um, And obviously the program itself is focused really broadly on environmental issues, but I always found a way to apply what I was learning to marine issues and to the ocean. Um, My family is from the Azores Islands off of Portugal, and so seafood has always been such a huge part of my identity, and the ocean has just always been really close to my heart. Um, I also became a scuba diver around the time that I started my undergrad. And so my love for the ocean and this like undergrad program in environmental governance and sustainability were all like growing and coming together at the same time. And uh, seafood really became the focus of my career, um, actually after falling out with a marine conservation organization. Um, long story short, you know, their motto was that if you wanted to save the oceans, you couldn't eat seafood and that it was just not possible. And if you cared about the ocean, you had to stop eating fish. And like I said, you know, seafood has always been such a huge part of my family, of our culture. Um, and like I felt as part of my identity and still feel today is a really big part of my identity. And so I really, um, I didn't accept that. And I, you know, I really felt in my heart that they were wrong, you know, seeing the people who were fishing on these Odish islands and thinking like they love the ocean and are so dedicated to protecting the ocean. There's no way that they... Um, they them fishing or providing seafood for their families or or economic livelihoods for their communities is harmful to the oceans and so basically i dedicated the rest of my career to to proving them wrong and and showing people that you can eat seafood sustainably and it is possible to enjoy food from the ocean in a way that also protects the oceans and manages our marine ecosystems i think that's a, a great um way of going about it and you're saying like proving them wrong but i think a lot of other people kind of fit in those same shoes as you and seafood is a big part of their life um uh you know people in canada especially a lot of northern canada a lot of people love fishing and fishing is a big aspect of their life and something they continue wanting to do so having this um like your instagram page and stuff like that for to follow to show people um that this is an option and there is a way of going about it sustainably so that uh you know, you can continue to have seafood and fish and, you know, uh, other aquatic species in your constant uh, dietary. Um, But recently, you've kind of been studying the impact of COVID-19 on the North America seafood industry. What made you want to investigate this? And can you tell us anything about your results to date? Yeah, so, I mean, I have to preface this um, answer by saying that I work in the coolest graduate lab. (laughs) I'm obviously a little bit biased, but I work with some really ambitious and creative, wonderful people, um, including Dr. Phil Loring, who's my advisor, and Dr. Hannah Harrison, who's a postdoc in our lab um, and a mentor and dear friend to me. And they love seafood as much as I do. And anyway, in kind of early March, April of 2020, we were hearing from a lot of our fishing contacts and friends that they were facing some challenges as a result of supply chain disruptions and lockdown orders with restaurants being closed um, and things like processors not being able to um, access the the temporary foreign workers that they need. And we had kind of, as a lab, been waiting um, waiting on a story or the right moment to launch a podcast project. We're passionate about knowledge mobilization um, and reaching audiences outside of academia. And we'd kind of like tried a few things in the past, but we always felt like we were kind of forcing it. And so when COVID happened and we were hearing these stories just naturally coming to us, we realized that this was it, like this was the chance that we've been waiting for. 
And so, so far, um, I mean, we're almost a year into it now, and we're actually wrapping up that first season of social efficiencing of the podcast. Um, and we've seen a, um, a wild amount of changes. We actually also have a, a paper and peer review based on the first um, 20 or so episodes of the podcast as well. Um, and some of the big things that we've been seeing, and I'm sure like yourself and anybody else, um, who's been reading the news lately has seen like there's been a huge uptick in consumers eating seafood at home. Um, and it's something like, I think the stats like 80% of seafood is, you know, consumed in restaurants or consumed outside of the home. And so when COVID um, closed restaurants, uh, people were really forced to, if they wanted to, to get seafood, if they wanted to access that fish um, or that marine protein, they needed to find a way to cook it at home. And so it was really, really great to see that more and more people were um, being forced to experiment at home and learning how to cook seafood at home. I myself was one of those people, like I admit I was not very um, savvy in the kitchen prior to COVID and because I was forced into it, I learned really, really quickly um, as many people all around the world did. And that was really great to see that so many more people were um, trying seafood and getting familiar with it. And then some of the other things that we saw um, that was particularly interest to, interesting to me was a, uh, a growth, a large growth in membership to alternative seafood networks. So alternative seafood networks are actually the focus of my thesis project. Um, and when I say alternative seafood networks, I'm referring to things like community supported fisheries or subscription based seafood programs. Um, they're basically some smaller scale uh, direct marketing operations. Um, and we were noticing that those types of businesses were seeing a massive growth and membership um, as the markets that consumers could access seafood at started to dwindle. You know, restaurants were closing. We saw um, seafood counters at grocery stores started to close. And really, these retailers or these ASNs, as we refer to them, um, became one of the only sources um, that consumers could access seafood. And so there was a huge uptick in them. Um, and then also, I think a lot of consumers, as a result of some of these supply chain disruptions, started to really be more conscious of where their food was coming from. And we also attribute the large growth in ASN membership to that as well. You know, consumers were realizing that when their food is coming from overseas or they don't know where their food is coming from, and then we have something like a massive pandemic that disrupts import and export markets, that has serious implications on our food systems. And so people started looking for more local food options, including local seafood options, which really helped um, those alternative seafood network businesses. And then the last kind of thing we noticed on that similar vein with the ASNs was that they um, seem to be a little bit more resilient or a little bit more insulated from the impacts of the pandemic. Um, because they, a lot of them are based on this like pre-subscription model where consumers have to purchase a share of the catch at the beginning of the fishing season, a lot of these models already had collected payment and weren't worried about finding an end market because they already had it locked in um, prior to the fishing season even beginning. Whereas for a lot of fishermen who weren't selling into ASNs, they were really left scrambling uh, when restaurants closed. Restaurants are a huge outlet for a lot of fishermen. Um, they often offload massive quantities of fish, as you can imagine. Um, and same with grocery stores and then export markets as well, especially because um, the COVID-19 pandemic kind of started right around um, the Chinese New Year, which is a huge market, especially for like Canadian um, lobster products that come from out east. And so a lot of those fishermen were left scrambling. They had an oversupply of product, especially when processors stopped buying fish again because they didn't have access to those temporary foreign workers. Um, and we saw that those um, those direct sales models or those community supported fisheries models just weren't scrambling as much and actually seemed to um, be thriving because they were sort of insulated from that uh, from that global impact. And so it was really interesting to see. And then it's been interesting to watch them uh, to watch them grow over the last year um, and experience a little bit of good fortune in, in the midst of all this craziness. Yeah, I think uh, you, you're focusing a lot on fisheries, which is fantastic because that's an avenue that we here don't necessarily are able to fully understand. And um, kind of what you're seeing is what we see here in an aquaculture setting is watching these businesses have to alter and change because restaurants are closing. And um, even for ourselves, like we sell our um, Oceanwide certified Arctic char to distributors that uh, then sell those to um restaurants. So we've had a huge uh, effect in our own um, our, our own facility and we're we don't even focus necessarily on uh, our Arctic tar sales. That is something we do on the side other than our research, but we've seen local um, 
aquaculture facilities adjust their complete business plan, go from, you know, fingerling sales to selling their local fish and shipping their local fish in boxes to people. Mm-hmm. Because like you're saying, you know, um, it's like oysters. You don't hear a lot about people eating oysters at home because no one knows how to shuck them or are able to shuck them. So it's a very specific niche. There's restaurants that that's all they do. And I think it's had a huge effect across the board, whether it's, you know, coming from the ocean or it's coming from a aquaculture setting, people are being affected and having to adjust through COVID. So it has been really fascinating to see people change and grow in a different way and take advantage of this like specific situation we're in when it's really had a huge effect on everybody's operation, regardless of what it looks like. But in addition to your studies at the University of Guelph that you were just mentioning, you have also just mentioned you are co-host of the Coastal Roots Radio. What was the driving force to kind of start this up? Yeah, so um, so like I said, our our lab, and this is totally attributed to to Phil and Hannah, they're very passionate about knowledge mobilization and you know research impact and making sure that the work that we're doing is uh, meaningful to the to the partners that we're working with um, and it is accessible beyond an academic audience. And so this podcast project, like I said, it kind of been something that was kind of in the works for a long time. Like we'd tried a few things here and there, but everything kind of felt like we were forcing it. And then, you know, once we started hearing these stories, we thought this, this is it and this is the moment. And it was a really unique opportunity to be able to hear stories as they were happening and then also relay them as they're happening. I mean, I'm sure you're aware like the academic process and getting papers and peer review and published is is long and tedious and like I said we um we actually still have a paper in review based on the podcast and while we've been waiting on the paper to to be reviewed and published we've still been doing the podcast and so um just to think that if we hadn't done the podcast and we just collected those interviews for the purpose of that paper like none of the information that we've collected would be out there yet Um, and so the podcast really gave us this unique opportunity to hear stories in real time and basically produce them and share them as quickly as we were getting them which was incredibly important especially at the beginning of the pandemic when things were changing so rapidly Um, like every single episode we felt like we had something new and exciting we almost felt like a news channel like things were just changing and like you said like um, different different seafood um, different aspects of the seafood supply chain were responding and adapting and pivoting so quickly that um, the podcast was really the only way that we felt to like keep up with that and be able to share those changes in real time and it's just been really rewarding for us as well to be able to share that with the people that we're speaking to and to reach non-academic audiences and basically every we're still like I said to this day we're kind of wrapping up that first season now we're ending we're hoping to end our our COVID coverage at the at the one year mark and I can definitely say that when we started this we had no idea that we would be in this for a year Um, but we're hoping to kind of wrap that up and and start the podcast focusing on some more like broader seafood issues related to sustainability and aquaculture and coastal resilience and different topics but basically like every week since since April 2020, we have been on the phone with, um, we started just with fishermen, but kind of as you just mentioned, like there have been um, impacts at every single stage of the seafood, seafood supply chain. And like when one link is broken or one link is impacted, the whole chain crumbles. And so we started reaching out to processors, distributors, even restaurant owners and chefs and retailers, um, and basically just trying to Um, add some transparency to an industry that has been notoriously opaque and just get this information out there and get consumers aware of how the industry is being impacted and doing our best to share the stories of the seafood industry workers that we speak with um, and making sure that they you know have that platform and their voices are being heard. I think it's fantastic the work you guys are doing. I've uh, listened to quite a bit of your episodes. I'm pretty sure I've almost navigated almost all of them just through my work day feeding fish I just pop in my headphones and listen and uh, I uh, just got to talk to uh, Jennifer Bushman she's located uh, out west and she's also a huge advocate for sustainable seafood and I think the work that you know like she's doing that the work that you guys are doing is fantastic to really open the conversation up with people that are not only just academic but people in the fishing uh, like aquaculture and fisheries um, environment, but people outside of that and um, making people have those conversations in their own, in their home to make those adjustments. And, um, you know, I'll just talk about my own series that I'm doing right now. It's kind of been a years in the work, like I've been working on getting this up and running for about a year. 
um, and just talking about, okay, what's the goal of this and, you know, what are we going to try and do with this interview? And because of COVID, um, a big part of what I do here is we host hundreds of people every year and we do tours and seminars and people come here and we do um, like classes and stuff like that. And that's completely been, you know, discredited because of COVID because we can't have people coming and touring and stuff like that. So I was like, what is a way we are able to reach, you know, students and academia people and people that necessarily are looking to get into aquaculture or people who are just curious about what's going on in the aquaculture world, especially because of COVID. And like you're saying, so many people want to get their story out there and people want to talk about what's happening because they want the conversation to keep growing. And I think it's fantastic the work you guys are doing over there. Um, but like I just you recently on Coastal Routes Radio, um, I remember you kind of mentioning that you have noticed a lack of fit, fresh seafood in your local grocery store. Do you consider locally farm fish as a sustainable seafood, uh, seafood source? Sorry. Yes. So kind of like really early on in the pandemic, so I guess like would have been like March to May of last year, I noticed that when I would go to the grocery store, like the seafood counters were completely bare. Um, and I've learned now it was a little bit of a combination of things. It was partly due to supply chain disruptions and not being able to get um, some of that fish that we import here in Canada. And then the other concern was that um, grocery stores opted to close seafood counters to limit um, like uh, employees touching fish and then handing it over just because at that point we were so, I mean, I think still like unsure of how the virus was transmitted and whatnot. Um, and so that has changed a little bit. And I know now that um, there are quite a few seafood counters that have reopened um, with different sets of precautions. But to answer your question, yeah, I do think that locally farmed fish is a sustainable seafood choice, especially here um, in Ontario, where there's so much great work being done to find new ways uh, to sustainably harvest new species of fish. And basically, I, like, I think it's really unique because we are giving variants access to some really high quality seafood that they may not have had access to otherwise and so I think especially here in Ontario the aquaculture industry is a really great source of sustainable seafood. Yeah I, I think yeah. I mean I, I'm biased I work in an aquaculture facility <laughs> but I think um, aquaculture is uh, a big part of the conversation in sustainability and um, the facilities itself whether it's land-based or you know in the natural environment um, you know, in the natural environment, you have more of a channel you have to follow with what species you grow. But I think, you know, incorporating land-based aquaculture, you're able to grow so many different species, especially using a recirculating aquaculture system. You know, you can grow species that like barramundi that love or tilapia and stuff like that, that love warm water that we might not be able to grow here year round if we didn't have these facilities. And and that, I think it's fantastic to see the development and seeing more and more aquaculture um, facilities um, start to, you know, kind of make a home in certain areas so that there is that type of like even food security for uh, certain communities. And um, and it's really taking advantage of, you know, technology and a method um, and to use it in different ways. Um, so what are the so, things that a consumer would need to know to, to kind of determine if a seafood option comes from a sustainable source? Are there any useful tools for consumers to use? Yeah, so I always say that there are three things that consumers should know in order to make a sustainable choice, and that is the species of the fish, where it was caught, and how it was caught. Um, and so knowing the species of the fish, the exact species of the fish, you know, not just salmon, but sockeye salmon, um, is really important. And then being able to identify, you know, where in the world that fish was caught, and then how it was caught. And if you know those three things, you can take that information and put it against something like the Monterey Bay Aquarium Seafood Watch Guide or the OceanWise Guides, um, and you can, you know, see where those different programs rank that species you know they might say that sockeye salmon caught here in this way is sustainable but if it's caught you know here in this way it's maybe not the best choice um, and that's really great to help you identify fisheries that are being well managed versus fisheries that aren't um, and fishing gear and fishing uh, methods that are more sustainable than others and then another great tool that i always recommend um, again my research focuses on alternative seafood networks um, is the local catch seafood finder um, and local catch is basically a network that connects different alternative seafood networks like community supported fisheries 
And they have this really cool seafood finder map on their website that will allow consumers to identify um, community supported fisheries or other like small scale sustainable direct market operations close to them that uphold the values of the local catch network, which are ingrained in things like sustainability and for fishermen and you know responsibly managed fisheries around the world and so that's a great tool if you're you know just trying to if you're trying to figure out what's what's around you and what's available locally to you so do you think people need to incorporate more seafood into their diets and and how can they do this Yes, I think that everybody should be eating more seafood. Um, I think there are so many health benefits to seafood consumption. You know, even if you just take away all of the sustainability concerns about seafood, like it's just a really um, rich source of macronutrients. The macronutrient profile of seafood, like I don't think can be replicated in any sort of like GMO or veganized or something product like that. I think that, you know, the, the macronutrient profile of seafood products is just impeccable. Um, there, there's so many vitamins and nutrients in seafood that we need like omega threes and vitamin D and iron. And, um, it's just, it's, like the healthiest protein on the planet is what I tell people. It's the best thing that you can eat. Um, it's also uh, one of the leanest sorts of proteins, especially in comparison to things like chicken and beef. So, you know, for things like, you know, weight management and things like that, seafood is definitely a better option. And then, yeah, when you look at the sustainability side, seafood has a much lower carbon footprint than things like chicken or beef. And even some seafood products like, you know, oysters that are our farmed product actually have like a, um, a smaller carbon footprint than a lot of vegan products and oysters actually do a lot of work to um, you know restore ocean ecosystems and marine ecosystems and so i think that everybody should give seafood a try and i think that you know you don't have to go all out you don't need to like you know cut out meat immediately and switch everything to seafood i think that just starting you know once a week or something like incorporating seafood into your diet and starting simple starting with what you know like what i love about seafood is that it's so easy like all you need is like butter and garlic on a, on a piece of seafood and it tastes amazing like it's so easy to prepare it's so quick to prepare as well and so just starting by incorporating it once or twice a week is a great start um, and then I always encourage people to like speak to people at the seafood counter and ask questions I know you know with COVID it might be a little bit more difficult right now but I think that speaking to the people that you're getting your fish from speaking to people involved in the seafood industry is a great way to you know get um get more knowledgeable about what's locally abundant in your area get like recipes ideas and tips the one thing that i've learned over the last couple of years of doing this work in the seafood industry is that people in the seafood industry love to talk and they are super passionate and excited about breaking down some of those barriers that make it you know difficult or intimidating for consumers to eat more seafood and so i encourage people to you know to talk to people and ask questions and more more often than not like you'll get an answer and and then some <laughs> Yeah, I think it's fantastic. Um, coming into the aquaculture world, um, I kind of came from uh, fisheries research side of things, uh, working for the government, and I made the transition into aquaculture, um, I guess, like almost two years ago, which is kind of crazy. But even in those two years of being kind of in this world, um, everyone I talk to is so enthusiastic and so passionate about what they do, whether it's, you know, researchers, students, um, you know, privately owned businesses, like uh, second generation farmers, things like that. Everybody that's doing what they're doing is so passionate and love to share all their information on what they're doing um, and just getting their story out there. And I think it's fantastic to see um, people doing what they love. And I think, um, I think everyone should be doing kind of, you know, a little bit about what they love because uh, people put way more effort, I think, into something that they do uh, when they love it so much. And, uh, but that's kind of all I have for you today. Uh, do you have any last like tidbits that you want to share with us before we sign off? No, I don't think so. Um, like I said, thanks for having me. This was awesome. I am like, I'm one of those people who is eager to talk about seafood and, you know, share what I know and make it easier for people to eat more seafood. So um, I will say that if people want to listen to the podcast, um, you can search like Coastal Roots Radio, wherever you listen to podcasts. We're on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, all that good stuff. Um, and then my social media, Seaside with Emily, pretty much everywhere. Um, and my website has a bunch of different information about seafood sustainability. Um, if people do want more information about that as well. 
Yeah. yeah, perfect. Thank you so much, Emily, for joining me today and sharing the efforts in both research and advocacy that you are doing informing people about sustainable seafood. Um, everything we talked about today, I will link, you know, the podcast and your social media handle down below so people can just click a link and pop right on over to this, see what's going on. But uh, yeah, thank you again for sitting down and sharing uh, with us all that you do. Thanks. Okay. Hey guys, I hope you liked the video today. If you did, please swim on over and hit the like button and subscribe. Comment below if you have any questions you want answered in any of our future videos. Hope to see you next time.